Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic naturopathic doctor and founder of Amour de Soi Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and this is my incredible co-host, Donovan. And today we have a very special guest, Anya Khan is a multifaceted creative entrepreneur and a globally awarded, collected, and exhibited artist, photographer, graphic web designer at Exilium House Design, the host of the Create and Inspire podcast, a published author, as well as a teacher and inspirational speaker. Please welcome Anya. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Awesome. Great. So you have accomplished quite a lot in your life. Would you like to tell us a little about your story and your journey into all the things that you're due? Yeah, of course. Of course. So um, my story is a little uh, different and strange. I didn't expect to be an artist. This is not the world that I expected I would be in. Um, mm -hmm. but things in my life kind of shifted. And so when I was younger in my teenage years, I started to have a lot of health issues and I wanted to go to school to be a therapist mm -hmm. and I was unable to do so because I had a lot of health challenges. And during that time I was told it was all in my head. And so that went on for, um, almost, almost 20 years of, uh, dealing with that. And so art kind of became a salvation place for me a place where um, I could deal with things that were going on because there wasn't any acknowledgement. There wasn't any understanding. There wasn't any real support from um, even really people around me. Because when you go to a doctor regularly and they're like, listen, like you, uh, you know, like we're thinking there's something wrong. It's like, yeah, there may actually be. And that's totally fine because mental health is an important thing. and shouldn't be made fun of either. However, I know that there was something physical in association with that. And, you know, people in your life start to kind of feel like, you know, the boy who cried wolf, like, okay, we've had these tests. Okay. We've seen this stuff. No one is finding anything. So apparently you're neurotic. So art became this, uh, salvation place. I started just really expressing myself through different types of photo manipulation and photography and writing. And I'd always been creative. So this isn't like a far cry from something that I had already really been into when I was younger. Um, I just really disassociated from it and went into a more conventional type of thought because my family was like, yeah, no, you can't be an artist, <laughs> you know, like you need to do something that can support your family. And so I didn't even consider the option mm -hmm. that art or creativity could even be the foundation of a career. Mm -hmm. And so that's just kind of the root of where it all started and kind of why I got into publishing and running a gallery and doing podcasts and the whole bunch of things that I've done because when you're, you're stuck at home and you aren't able to function, I'm a very driven person. So I couldn't just sit there. So I took in a lot of books and I did a lot of art and I did everything that I could do to try to make myself feel relevant in the world. And thank goodness for the internet at that point, because it really helped the feeling of isolation. It really helped me be able to get my artwork out there, get it into galleries, connect with magazines, connect with people like you. It's been a big doorway to me. Like a lot of people are experiencing with COVID right now, this whole lock in and thank goodness we have Zoom and all this stuff. You know, I was dealing with this 20 years ago and just thankful for the small steps of being able to connect with the world around me. Yeah. So I think uh, I just want to highlight, I'm, I'm sure we're going to go into all kinds of other topics, but I really wanted to highlight one piece of your story that I think is really important, which is that even if, you know, there are people, and I know a couple of people who experience these symptoms of things like some form of illness and then go to the doctor and have a hard time getting a, a pinpointed diagnosis from a physical ailment. Um, I think some people take that as like, oh, if we can't find the physical thing, then it's fake or it's some like you're not experiencing that. But I wanted to really highlight that uh, maybe not everyone knows you genuinely experience whatever the symptoms are <laughs> like that's an actual part of the experience, whether or not a doctor is able to pinpoint 
what is causing it. And even if it is coming from a mental place, like there's still some part of your brain that's causing the actual, you know, symptoms. So it's not this sort of like faking thing that I feel like, um, you know, people at the surface level of this sort of discussion um, kind of experience sometimes. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, I do have actual questions and things that I want to know. Um, I just really wanted to hone in on that because I think it's important. Um, It is very important. I just want to say it is very important. And I think um, even if it is what they would call psychosomatic or whatever, it's a real experience for a human being, whether or not there's a root cause or, or maybe it's trauma that's going on in their life that's then physical elements are being shown through because that's how they're processing. It should be taken very seriously. And I agree with you. 100%. Yeah. Cause if it's, if, you know, if you're having nausea or something, it's not that you're saying you have nausea when you don't, it's that you have nausea and they can't quite figure out what the root is. And I don't know. I just feel like it's so important to highlight, uh, but onto the the question bit, which is, I kind of wanted to get into a little bit more around your journey through sort of this, this illness piece and then this creativity piece. So I'm curious just to start out with what sort of avenues you were able to find because it sounded like you had uh some some limitations from the illness you were facing um and i'm just curious like what methods you used to figure out what kinds of art you were able to do that's a great question so i was very limited and that is correct um uh, my disease specifically a uh, large part of it is being allergic to pretty much everything Um, so it limited me from doing a lot of things. And then I also suffered from agoraphobia because I was having these, uh, allergic reactions or panic attacks because they really do like coexist. Like you have an allergic reaction, your body goes into panic. You have a panic attack. And if you have this disease, you can have an allergic reaction. So there's this, uh, circular situation, uh, that occurs. And so I was unable to really go out a lot because I would find when I would get into a car that I would end up having more issues. Or if I went places, I was obviously being affected by the environment. So I really locked in a lot. And one thing that, um, got me into it is really just being on the internet and seeing these other people being creative and then going like, well, maybe I could do that. Like maybe I need something to do you know, maybe that's something I can do and it would be fun. Like, I really feel it's important to create a sense of joy in our lives, right? A sense of like, even if something is challenging or even if you're going through a right time, how often can you reach for something joyful, even if it's minuscule, because that can help rebalance. And I've always kind of felt that part of my life, like even when things are really bad, I'm like, how do I reach for joy? And that was joyful, like seeing art. And I was like, well, I can do that. You know, I've always loved to do that. And I was on deviant art and like these other, you know, these other places just kind of um, doing the thing. And slowly it, it shifted um, because I went out of the house and I went to this little park and they were having a tiny festival there. And it was mostly kids. And I sat down at this uh, picnic table and they were doing watercolor. And I thought, oh, I think I can like, cause it was pencil. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that. Cause I'm allergic to almost all mediums. Not so much now that shifted recently, but for the last 15 years, I haven't been able to touch watercolor, colored pencil, acrylic. I've had to be digital because of my severe allergies. Mm. So um, at that point, this gentleman walks up to me and says, Hey, you know, do, do you, can I take your picture? And of course I'm like super uncomfortable. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, why? And he's like, well, I work for the local newspaper and I just want to, you know, take a picture of you with these kids. And I was like, okay, it didn't seem as like predatory because you just don't know. (laughs) Some guy just walks up to you like, can I take your photo? You're like, I'm pretty sure that's a no. Um, (laughs) This this is back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And um, we exchanged numbers. And later on, uh, we created a a longstanding friendship. His name is Roger. And um, I was doing music at the time. Just I want to throw back then I was uh, doing music. And I was also doing graphic and web design prior to the art thing. So um, it's one of the things I had kind of jumped into just for fun again. And he I needed a photo for a calendar I was going to be in because I was in this band and it was just myself. The music was just me. I was, it's like a female nine inch nails. I was creating, you know, my own synth lines, my own drum lines, doing all the production on my own. And I needed something for a goth calendar at the time. And so I was like, called him up and we just became good friends. And he saw some of the art I was doing. 
because it was very private and it was very much like a personal journal. Like, you know, cause I dealt a lot with my illness as well as, um, my very adverse childhood situations that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, have you thought about putting this into a gallery? And I'm like, pretty sure that's also a no, <laughs> like, you know, like uh-huh. you think about taking it, you know, your journal of your most private things and saying, Hey, I'm going to put it up on a wall. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. But then I thought about it and thought, well, I've always wanted to help people. Like that is like intrinsically in me. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. This help, the need for help, helping others is there. And I said, well, you never know. Let's give it a try. And so I did. And after that, my career just, you know, continued to go on. But he was really a big connection into uh, the gallery world. Mm -hmm. And then um, from the graphic and web design stance, because that's the job that I do along with art that actually pays my bills independently over the last 20 years, came from a friend donating a computer to me and just said, here, here's some programs. Maybe you want to play with them. And now I'm sitting here with my own business, you know, Mm -hmm. 20 years later. So really connections, if you want to know the answer, it's really connections. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a super inspirational story because, you know, uh, what what I was hearing out of it, like the thing that made a difference, even though you were kind of hesitant with meeting this random stranger and then also hesitant to put your art in a gallery, you know, you had that fear and hesitation, but you decided to step out of it Mm -hmm. and go for it. And it opened up so many possibilities for your life and you were able to make a career out of it. I think that is really profound and um, inspirational for people to know. like, yeah, when you, you, when you step outside of your comfort zone, cause you don't know what's going to happen next. It could have been a dead end connection. Yeah. You never know. That's actually how Donovan and I met. We were just <laughs> like random connections on LinkedIn and we didn't know each other, but then we connected and oh, we made friends and then we created a podcast together. So, I love that. So, um, you just never know. Yeah, you really never know. And the thing that you touched on earlier that I did want to comment on was the whole, the whole thing about you know allergies or panic attacks um, manifesting out of like even though there wasn't like they couldn't figure out the root cause or really explore that. It it is so real. I see that so many times. And the thing that you touched on that I didn't want to step over was that you know trauma and past childhood wounds yes dramatically manifest in these physical types of symptoms and I see that a lot and you know you can't blame the doctor because they don't know how to deal with the trauma or even like look at it um but it's just like something people should consider exploring if if they've tried everything else and they haven't really delved into that and they knew (laughs) they had some childhood stuff they they probably should address maybe that's someone uh something worth exploring who who's an expert in like that trauma field who can do it like safely. Um, Cause you know, you want to unravel the layers in a way where you can feel, feel safe. But I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that point because I think that's a really important point for our, our viewers in case they're in a similar situation as you, where they have, you know, health concerns and they don't know what's causing it. Um, yeah. Another factor to look at. Oh, it's a, it's a big factor. When I lecture at colleges and universities and, um, work with people on art and trauma, Mm -hmm. it is something that is like very prevalent and understood. It's like, there are so many people who have Mm -hmm. had horrible things go on as a child. And the, the, I mean, the ACEs score, if people don't know about that, they should check their ACEs score, which basically takes your childhood trauma and it gives you score a score to match how easily you're going to have physical ailments based on the adversity that you've experienced. And that ACEs score can help you, like you're saying, kind of be able to bring that to a doctor and say, listen, like, this is all the stuff I've dealt with. This, this can affect my genes. This can affect my immune system. All of these things actually affected my development of who I am as a, as an an adult. Mm -hmm. And then this can help them because doctors, and I know, you know, this don't, I mean, I think Western medicine is changing, Mm -hmm. but the whole body perspective, not just looking at symptoms, but it's like, well, what are you eating? What are you drinking? How are you sleeping? What are your relationships like? You know, how is your work? You know, have you had past traumas and have you dealt with them? And if you have not, how can we get you help in the safest way possible? Plus there's so many other things in trauma that people don't know that we don't have to just go to talk therapy. There's Mm -hmm. somatic therapy. There's EMDR therapy. 
there's art therapy. There's so many ways that we are learning to process trauma in the, in the world of psychology that has nothing to do with re harming ourselves by going over the traumas again in our heads. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'm just passionate about that. Really. It's important. <laughs> it's important. No, I, I, I feel you because as a, a naturopathic doctor, that's exactly what uh, I look at, like their whole life, you know, their relationship, what they put in their bodies, their past trauma. It's like all, all feeding into the picture. We got to look at all these various components to really help people heal. So as I'd be curious, you know, uh, it sounds like you've been on this healing journey for a while. Um, like what are the, the things that kind of what, or any like breakthrough moments for you on that journey? That you oh, like sure. Yeah. So I have been somebody who's tried a lot of different things based mm-hmm. in the fact that I like research and yeah. I don't like to give up. <laughs> so it tells me, it tells me that it's in my head and I'm like, mm-hmm. I know it's not. I sure I feel beat down and, and absolutely. I'm not just like going to rise above things. Cause I believe in like, yeah, I experienced that feeling and it sucks, but I can also get back up. Mm-hmm. Um, really for me, it's that ability to, 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 um, have autonomy in my body and recognize that my experiences are my own and my partner, my family, my doctor will not understand those experiences and to not, um, devalue that if this is how I feel, then I own that. And I, and I find a way to work through that as well as being able to, um, create expressively, um, emotional turmoil. I've always made this joke when I lecture at college and universities, like we would have less shootings and postal stuff, you know, like all the crazy stuff that not, you know, not postal stuff, but they always talk about postal shootings because they're under so much stress. Mm -hmm. We would have less of those violent situations if people were able to process and we were open to dark thoughts, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, expressing ourselves with dark art, you know, all of these things. I mean, there's a level of course with violence in, in movies and other things that of course they can tip to the line of being unhealthy, but there's also a positive expression of the darker side of ourselves that I think it's important to be able to do as well as being able to look at my illness and be willing to accept what it is, where I'm at, be willing to live in that pit of despair, go there, live there for a minute, but know that I can resurface and then have a toolbox, Mm -hmm. a, a very large toolbox of things that changes per the parts of my life. Maybe right now these tools are needed and maybe there's a death in my family. And now I need to use these other tools. I think a lot of times um, people are, are given tools and it's like, okay, these are the fundamental things that you need to do. And it's like, no, we are ebbing and flowing. Our entire body is this ebb and flow. And we have to feel what's in right. What do we need right now? What is, what does it help us do right now? And then of course, just like the traditional stuff. I've been in therapy on and off since I was 14 years old. I got into therapy behind my family's back in high school. And I just, you know, I got in with my a therapist there and, and he really helped me navigate the, um, I had a suicide of a friend in high school. I was obviously dealing with challenges with my family. And I reached out to him in the last couple of years to let him know, like he really changed my life. Like I, I, I myself attempted suicide in high school. And if he wasn't there, I really don't know if I would be here today. So, um, you know, having that kind of resource, general therapeutic resources, knowing that with my illness, I have doctors that are, you know, behind me and then things like I do EMDR. I love EMDR. You know, I think, um, somatic things like, you know, if you are feeling a certain way, we often just kind of crouch in and, and do those most like I'm feeling angry. Well, they talk about polar bears right? How polar bears deal with trauma is they shake it off. They just shake it off. And so they're trying to bring that into um, modern day help with human beings. Like you can shake it off and you can do this. So really for me, it's just having all these tools. And of course, in this session that we're talking right now, I'm not going to be able to tell all the things, but there's a lot. There's, there's so many things out there. And now that there, we have the internet, we have all of these podcasts, 
we have so many resources that can fit to us rather than 10, 20 years ago, there was this formula and these are the things that are available. It's like, no, we can curate our own healing approach and have more control over that now. And knowing that you can't, you know, it's important. Yeah, there was a couple of things that resonated with me as you were talking there. Um, one of them that really stood out is a talk. And we've talked about this a couple of times before, but kind of having space to uh, be in your emotions, right? And your feelings and your thoughts and explore them in a way and, instead of pushing back against them. And, you know, it goes to, uh, I, I will use what, I use aggression instead, but, you know, mm -hmm. having the space to explore like aggressive thoughts and feelings, uh, yeah. maybe not making a plan, like that's terrible. Like maybe not a way to make, like sure. execute violence, but having the space to actually like make space for those thoughts and feelings and say like, oh, I feel like this right now. And this, uh, maybe this is because of this or, you know, explore around in those ways, I think is really important. And especially around, you know, like grief or suicidality or depression or, or some of mm -hmm. these other feelings. I think that's extremely important for people to understand mm -hmm. because the, the default, again, or like the surface level that yep. is often talked about is to just like, push that away and crush it down as far as you possibly can. Uh, which means at some point it's going to it's come, back come back with, with a fury. Um, That's right. So I thought, I thought that was a, a really important point. And another thing, uh, like one of my core philosophies around any of this, like personal improvement type of stuff, well-being things is, is basically being flexible with the tools that you end up using and trying because there's not going to be one tool set that works for anyone. Like you were saying, it's mm -hmm. about kind of going through all these different processes and picking out the different ones that, oh, this one works. This one seems to be doing something. This one seems to be doing something for me in these certain circumstances, like you were saying, depending mm -hmm. on where you're at, where your ebb and flow is, what what's going on in your life. And I've just found that that to be very true for myself as well. As I pick, pick out tools from various podcasts and the internet and other resources that I consume, I end up with this tool set that allows me to, with more and more situations. I love what you said. Thank you for, for saying that. I think it's really important. I agree. Mm -hmm. So there is another thing, uh, another thread that I wanted to open up, um, which is I imagine, and, and I could be completely wrong, but it sounded like maybe there were some uh, energy fluctuations that went along with some of the illness things that you were feeling or dealing with. And I'd be curious how you kind of managed because you said there's this piece of like driven wanting to get a lot of stuff done and another piece of not feeling good. So I'd be curious what, what you did to kind of balance those two things out. That's a great question. And the reason why that's a great question is because when you are a driven individual and you are put a roadblock in front of you, it's really frustrating. And it creates what I've noticed a lot with people who have chronic illness is this need to, I feel good enough. And I'm going to cram everything in there. I'm going to try to do everything I can. And then really it's counterintuitive because you're running your body into the ground and then you have to repair. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time, um, doing that quite a lot. Um, I'm much better about it now. I mean, my life just shift, shifted quite a bit, but I would, you know, like opening a gallery. I, you know, I was like, this is my dream. And when I got on, um, a feeding tube formula. I wasn't diagnosed, but it actually gave my body nutrition for the first time. I got a new renewal sense of energy. And I was like, I want to do this. I don't know if I'm going to live. I've always wanted to do this. And then I would, you know, do it for a few months. Things would happen. I would burn out. I'd have to close, move locations. I would try it again. And I wasn't able to keep it going for a long period of time because I didn't have that type of, um, long-term um, resilience because of this back and forth situation. So it's really hard to manage that kind of energy. And I think it is even, um, even more like exacerbated by the fact that I lost a period of time. So I lost like almost 20 years of my life. So once I got diagnosed a few years ago, I got a medication and like my whole world opened up. Then it was like gangbusters because not only was I chasing a clock in my daily life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I feel sick this day. I don't feel that bad this day. I'm going to do a ton of stuff. This, you know, not just that, but now I'm going, I lost 20 years of my life. I have so much to make up for. 
you know, so then that's also compressing that. And it's an ongoing battle for me. It's something where I've had to really learn to tune in and go, the engine is going and now the engine is starting to burn out. And before that engine gets to a place of just being destroyed and having to repair, then I stop because what happens is in the long term, and I think a lot of people um, don't understand this, is the more that you don't have your engine revved to the point of it failing, and then you have to jump it again and restart it. If you're able to stop that before it happens, your engine doesn't get continually worn down. And when you have times of positive, positive energy, um, productive energy, you can use it better and you have more of it. It's not such a, you know, an up and down extreme situation. It's more this, so your downs aren't as down. Your highs might not be as high, but that's also where it's a better place to be. So that's, I mean, that's a really great question. And it's something I do struggle with on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think we, we all to some degree have that I definitely, I know I can relate to that a hundred percent because, um, I, I also am someone that's like a go-getter and doing so many things. And it's like, there's never enough time. I got all these things to do, but I, like this week was a really jam packed week. And I start to feel like, oh, I'm starting to feel depleted and run down and, and kind of like you, I've had to like learn this lesson multiple times over instead of like, keep pushing, even though I'm tired to be like, okay, next week I'm going to actually block out times to like not do anything and rest and recover. So I'm not so burnt out because I know if I keep going at this pace, cause I've done it before, it's just like, I can't really be that effective at life in general. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a life lesson. I too had to discover many times over for sure. Mm-hmm. Totally. I think a lot of people do. I really do think it's a very common, especially in Western culture, you look at other cultures, they do take, take rests and, and naps and, and, and you're not looked at as a, as a bad person, you know, and right. in Western culture, it's like, we must work. You must work seven days a week, 50 hours a week. And if you're not doing that, then you're lazy. And it's like, well, that's not actually healthy. It's it. I hope that we can kind of shift. I think, what is it? France has like four, four day work weeks or something. I don't know. Right. But wherever <laughs> it is. Anybody who has four day work weeks is great. I know. <laughs> they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. I try to get away with like, no, I, I'm lucky if I get like one day off. <laughs> it's right. So terrible. Cause I'm like, my weekends are really to catch up on all the things I didn't get to in the week. Sure. So it's like, where do I, I need to factor in rest time a little bit more like Italians. They took what, like a two or three hour lunch. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And then also doing what you love also is challenging too. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're doing something you love, it's like, well, I'm painting this, but am I really working or am I playing? I'm not quite sure, <laughs> you know, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's another question that I had, which is kind of another jump away from what we were just talking about. But I'm curious, uh, you know, it sounds like there was quite a period where you were experiencing these symptoms, didn't have a diagnosis or anything dependent on and then you found something that that's been working for you. Yeah. I would be curious what <laughs> advice you have for others who are sort of on the same journey, but not at the point of finding what works. Cause like I said, I know a couple of people who have these sort of mysterious symptoms, just following them around with no real diagnosis, no real way to know what to do. Experiencing some of the same things you talked about where people are not giving them, uh, uh, not validating that the experience is real or exists or, that they're causing it somehow um, Mm -hmm. intentionally. So I would just be curious, what what are some of the thoughts or ideas you have around that for for other people on that journey? So that's a good question as well. All these are really great questions. You guys have a good question. (laughs) Um, You know, everybody's everybody's journey is gonna be different. and, and, And we all know that. But one of the things that I think is very important and sometimes it's hard to harness for people is that ability to, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight, like being able to be resilient, be able to come back, being able to be willing to be knocked down, be told no, be told you're crazy and just be willing to like take that and then move into another place and go, okay, that's the door that's closed, but there may be someone else who can help me. 
And of course, over 20, you know, 18 plus years of, you know, my life having doors closed in my face. I mean, at that point, it's kind of like, what's the point, right? Mm -hmm. But you have one life to live. You have one, that's it. That's all you get. And it's exhausting. Like, I'm going to be very clear. Like, I would not say that that's not an exhausting process, that it's an easy process to do because it sucks badly. It sucks. It's painful. It's, it's, it's just so full of exhaustion, but try to take care of yourself, try to get rest, try to believe in yourself, like know that what you're kind of like we said earlier, what you are experiencing is real to you. The end. No one else has to understand it. No one else has to feel it. I just realized I have paint on my hand as we're doing this. Um, this is real. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is real. Um, it's so hard to want to say that because when I think of, you know, I think of my life and thinking about all the times where I got knocked down, it's just like crying and just being frustrated and feeling it's starting to question yourself. Mm -hmm. maybe I am crazy. You know, at one point I was very, I was very open with one of my doctors when I went in to get a feeding tube. I was like, if I'm crazy, maybe I am crazy. I'm self-aware enough to be okay to ask if maybe you are right. You -hmm. know, like being able to question that and also be able to be introspective into yourself. Like, okay, if there are people who are questioning certain things, maybe there is something that you are missing because you are so focused on you know, maybe your symptoms, maybe there is something that you are overlooking because you're so focused on the symptoms that you're not hearing something that you may need to be, um, that may need to be heard as well as seeking alternatives. You know, there's so many alternatives to, um, any sort of help. I mean, even just talking to a friend, having a good quality friendship, family member, someone who can be there for you, securing your essential needs is really important. You know, getting the answers is great. Sometimes the answers don't do anything. They don't change much. Sometimes they do, but making sure that you have a foundation of supportive people that are there for you and you continue to believe in yourself and try to get back up when you can take some downtime rest. If you're not willing to fight and go look for a while, that's okay too. Take some time to rest. Then when you're ready, get back up again. Your journey is on your timeline. People that have health issues, people have dealt with loss. You know, there's all these expectations from the world. You should be over it by now. You should be this, you know, da, da, da. it's like, no, it's on your own time, your own time frame. Don't pressure yourself. You'll get where you need to go. It's your journey. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I, I resonate with all of that. It's a, it's an ongoing journey and it's about, you know, getting up after not just two or three knockdowns. Sometimes it's seven or 10 or 50, who knows it, it takes something, but as long as you take care of yourself, um, you can get through it. You know, what's the point of giving up if, if you're not, you're not really living at that point. So I totally resonate with all of that. And I, um, appreciate everything that you shared and your contribution to our, our happy docs show. Um, was there, was there anything you'd like to plug before we wrap up today? No, I'm good. Unless people want to visit my website to check out my art, that would probably be it. Or I'm Instagram, I'm at Instagram and YouTube and things like that. So awesome. Yes. Yes. For anyone who wants to check out Anya's art, check out her website. The links will be in the description below. Uh, thank you so much for being on our show. It's been a pleasure to have you. <laughs> you too. It was a great conversation. Thank you for providing this for people to listen to. It's wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and then go and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. If you check out in the description below, go to my website where you can get my free fast and easy guide to stress relief. Thanks again for checking us out and we'll see you next time. Bye.